everyone for um, the first years that I haven't met yet. I'm Francesca, I'm your clinical pharmacist in the ER. So I usually sit in CCT. So if you guys have any questions about medications, drug interactions, you know, anything pharmacy medication wire, just come find me or my phone number is posted uh, all around the ED. So just give me a call. But today we're gonna talk about antiarrhythmic medications, specifically in terms of AFib, SVT, and uh, uh, VTAC. So first we're gonna go over the classifying the different antiarrhythmic agents. Then we're gonna differentiate between rhythm and rate control, specifically for AFib. Uh, review the preferred treatment options for uh, SVT, and then ensure safe and effective dosing of antiarrhythmic drugs for ventricular tachycardias. So going, starting out with your antiarrhythmic drugs, there's, they're classified into four different classes based on their mechanism of action. As you see here, there's a ton of drugs, but mostly in this lecture, I'm just gonna be focusing on a handful of them, okay? So your first drugs um, are your class one, which are your sodium channel blockers, and those can be further subdivided into your class 1A, 1B, and 1C. So your class 1A are your quinidine, procainamide, and disapyramol, which cause moderate blockade of fast sodium channels. So these are your most proarrhythmic agents um, because they cause more prolonged QTC interval uh, prolongation. So they're not used as frequently as other agents that we see on the list. Um, although procainamide, as we'll see later on, is starting to come back into being used more for um, you know, AFib and uh, VTAC. But you can use these agents for both uh, atrial um, um, arrhythmias and ventricular arrhythmias. Your 1B classifications are your lidocaine and mexilatine, and these cause mild blockade of sodium channels. Uh, these are known to shorten the QTC interval, and um, they're relatively safe and mainly just used for your uh, ventricular tachycardias and arrhythmias. And lastly, you have your 1C, which are propafenone and flecainide, uh, and these cause a larger blockade of your sodium channels, um, but they have no effect on your QTC. Um, there, was, uh, there were two trials called the CATS 1 and 2 trials that showed increased mortality um, in patients with the previous MI when trying to reduce the frequency of PVCs. So they're not routinely used in patients uh, with left ventricular dysfunction, so just keep that in mind. Next, we have your uh, class two uh, antiarrhythmics, which are your beta blockers. So your main ones that you would likely use are uh, metoprolol and esmolol. Um, these can be used in both uh, atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. Then you have your class three, which are your uh, potassium channel blockers. Um, your main ones that you would likely use are pretty much amiodarone in, the, in this hospital. Um, but these are also known to uh, uh, prolong the QTC interval, so keep that in mind. And then your last class, or your uh, class four, is their calcium channel blockers, diltiazem, and verapamil. And these can be used both in your atrial and ventricular um, arrhythmias. So to further classify them and see where they actually work on the action potential, there's a little graph over there. So. Your class one, like I said, they're so, uh, sodium channel blockers. So they're gonna inhibit your depolarization, which is your phase zero. So their depolarization phase is the opening of your voltage gated fast sodium channels leading to the influx of uh, sodium. So your sodium channel blockers will block that and slow the conduction velocity. Um, your beta blockers or your class two, their major effects are on the sinus and AV nodes. So they inhibit your beta adrenergic activation of adenylate cyclase, which reduce the intracellular cyclic AMP, resulting in a decreased SA node pacing and triggered activity. Um, your uh, class three are your uh, potassium channel blockers and they prolong the repolarization phase which uh, an increased refractoriness. So the repolarization phase is calcium influx stops and the potassium efflux increases. And then your um, class four, your calcium channel blockers, these have the uh, major effect on their AV node and they slow the calcium channels and reduce the slope of the phases four, zero and four, inhibit the ACE node and um, AV node conduction and prolong the PR interval. So going into the different types of arrhythmias that I'll be focusing on today, the first one is gonna be AFib. 
So AFib is pretty much the main um, encountered cardiac arrhythmia that we see in the ER. Um, the main management in the ED is just to control the symptoms, assess the cardio cardiovascular risk and therapeutic goals that are established between the patient and their PCP, uh, especially if their diagnosis is uh, chronic, and determine whether it's paroxysmal, so less than seven days, or if it's persistent over seven days. Um, and the primary decision is whether the patient is a candidate for rhythm control or rate control, um, both of which overall uh, will improve the patient's symptoms. Rate control will, uh, is indicated for the majority of patients that we'll see in the ER who are symptomatic with AFib. The goals of treatment are hemodynamic stability with symptom control and achieving a heart rate of 80 to 100. But there is no clear first line agent for rate control, so you can pick either one, and we'll go into which agents we would prefer over another. So a common approach is if a patient has, already has a history of AFib, or is coming in with an episode of AFib, you can administer their home medication or you can trial a different one. So first we're gonna start out with your non dehydropyridine calcium channel blockers. These are diltiazem and brapamil. So they inhibit calcium channels from entering the slow, cha uh, slow channels or uh, sorry, they inhibit the calcium ions from entering the slow channels. Um, or select voltage-sensitive areas of vascular smooth muscle or myocardium during the depolarization. So they effectively reduce the ventricular rate as well as the vascular tone in a dose-dependent fashion. Um, mainly, the main adverse effect is the dose-related hypotension. The key thing to know is that they're kind of contraindicated in uh, patients that have a history of heart failure because they can worsen heart failure and lead to cardiogenic shock. So the main agents that we have are diltiazem and rapamil. You'll have the doses up here. We don't really use rapamil here. We use diltiazem, and as you'll see in most other institutions, diltiazem is your main agent of choice, but you'll have both. Um, and both of them are given as IV boluses and you can continue them with an infusion. And diltiazem has the option of giving it as an oral um, option after the IV boluses as well. Um, Next, we have our beta blockers. So the main ones that I would say that we use most is metoprolol, but then we also have esmolol that we can use as well. So they're both, um, they competitively inhibit your beta-1 adrenergic receptors. Um, metoprolol is easy, easy to dose, is 2.5 to 5 IV bolus, administered every five minutes, up to three doses. Um, the key thing compared to your calcium channel blockers is that it has a long duration of action, so it should sustain um, the rate control for a lot longer than the IV boluses of your calcium channel blockers. Um, and theoretically, it's more selective for the heart rate than the calcium channel blockers, although there's no high quality evidence demonstrating greater efficacy compared to those. Osmol is another option that you can use, um, especially if a patient has... Um, you know, a lower bl uh, blood pressure. Um, it's a good option because it has a, a rapid onset and its duration is about 10 minutes. So if a patient is has a tenuous blood pressure, this is a good agent to use because it'll be really quick on and really quick off. Whereas metoprolol is gonna last a lot longer in the system. So you could have like profound hypotension with it if in a patient that's already hypotensive. So how do you pick between the two? One, you can eat, if a patient's already on one of these, you can continue to try their home agent as an IV form, or you can try the other one. So there's been several systematic reviews and meta-analysis that compare diltiazem and metoprolol, and diltiazem was associated with an increased success of rate control in hospitalized patients with AFib compared to metoprolol, um, with no significant risk in hypotension or bradycardia in those who received it. Um, but then there's also retrospective studies in patients with AFib with heart failure uh, that showed that there was no difference in safety outcomes, including hypotension, ICU admission, or in hospital mortality. But there have been studies that show that metoprolol was actually superior and achieved a higher rate of cardioversion in patients with HEFREF. Um, current guidelines suggest avoiding calcium channel blockers in patients that have AFib with a history of um, HEFREF. So in those cases, use beta blockers or try to use rhythm control instead. Next we have digoxin. So ideally it's not recommended as your any of your first line options in the ER 
because it has a slow onset of action of up to six hours. So you won't see an immediate effect in the heart rate. Um, it takes a while to build up in the system. Um, so it's usually given as a 0.25 to 5, 0.5 milligram IV bolus, and then you give 0.25 IV every six hours up to uh, eight to 12 micrograms per kilo as the loading dose. You can either give it IV or then switch to oral. Um, it causes a direct suppression of the AV node conduction to increase the refractory period and decrease uh, conduction velocity. velocity. Um, it is a great option in patients that do have heart failure. So say if you have a patient that has AFib with heart failure, they mm -hmm. give him metoprolol, it hasn't worked. In this case, and you don't want to try antiarrhythmic agents, you can try digoxin. It could be a good option. Um, So say your rate control didn't work, then you have your rhythm control. So it's usually reserved for patients that have new onset or paroxysmal AFib. Um, but with these agents, with rhythm control, you have to also assess for thromboembolic risk. So uh, symptom onset within 48 hours of presentation to the ED. Uh, ideally, you want to do cardioversion to normal sinus rhythm, um, but, in, uh, cardio, uh, but anticoagulation may be indicated. So um, the ACC AHA guidelines recommend immediate anticoagulation prior to cardioversion for patients that have a CHADS2 VAS score of at least two. Um, but if they have a score of less than two, they don't require anticoagulation long-term. There's been multiple ED trials that show safety and efficacy of cardioversion or rhythm control. Um, with onset of symptoms within 48 hours. Um, so it's really important to recognize that these studies were completed in patients, in institutions that have close patient follow-up, reliability of symptom description, and these protocols should be individualized to the patient population. So here, it's a little bit harder. We have patients that don't follow up. So it might be a little bit difficult to see if they follow up with their anticoagulants and their cardiologists, but cardioversion is a good option um, if the patients have new onset AFib. Um, ideally, electrolyte synchronized cardioversion is the most effective and rapid approach to restoring your sinus rhythm, um, but it's uncomfortable. Patients don't enjoy it. I wouldn't enjoy being shocked either. So you want to do have some procedural sedation on board. Um, ideally with the Tomidate, some fentanyl, those are the most hemodynamically stable um, and just make the patients a little bit more comfortable before going undergoing cardioversion. So if electrical cardioversion is uh, not an option for the patient and they are hemodynamically stable, we have um, chemical cardioversion. So we have three options here that I'll talk about. So procainamide, flecainide, and amiodarone. So procainamide, as we said, is a class 1A um, antiarrhythmic. It's dosed as 10 to 17 mg per kg IV with a max dose of 1,500 milligrams given over 30 to 60 minutes. So the order in EPIC is listed as milligrams per minute, um, and you can select the option. Um, and it's been shown to be effective for cardioversion and AFib and AFLATER in multiple ED trials that show a success rate between uh, 50 to 60% within 60 minutes. Um, the only times you would want to discontinue procainamide infusion are if the sinus rhythm is restored, if the QRS exceeds 120, or if hypotension or bradycardia occurs. Next, we have flecainide, which we don't have here, but I know there are other hospitals that do do this in the ER, so it is something to keep in mind if you do go to other hospitals that do this. Um, it is a one-time dose of two to 300 milligrams orally, um, and it's used as an approach called pill in the pocket, where the patients just take it and you just monitor them um, for a while. And, and within six to eight hours, they show 60 to 80% um, sinus rate uh, conversion. And then we have amiodarone, which is probably the drug we are most familiar with here. Uh, the dose is 150 milligrams IV over 10 minutes, and that is your loading dose. So if you look on Epic for amiodarone, this is your loading dose option. And then you have your continuous infusion option, which is your one milligram per minute over six hours, and then 0 0.5 milligrams per minute for 18 hours. Um, it is not the best option for cardioversion in the acute setting, and it's not the best option in the ED just because it does take... Um, 
does have a controlling effect that may take some time to switch to, sorry. It does take a while to actually convert to um, normal sinus rhythm. So it may take up to days to weeks. So it's not the best option to use in these kinds of patients. Um, there was one multi-center randomized trial that looked at almost 400 patients that looked at using um, drug and drug first and then chemical and then cardioversion strategy versus electrocardio uh, versus electrical cardioversion um, and saw that there was a better efficacy of about 90 percent when you use drugs first and then electricity versus just electricity alone um, and that avoided the need for uh, and that it was more effective the drugs and cover and electricity combination. Um, the drug therapy was effective uh, alone, was effective in about 52% of patients, so about half of the time. Um, but that also avoided the need of sedation in these patients. So it's also a time intensive, um, like pro con benefit of whether you need to sedate the patients to give them cardioversion. Next, we have uh, supraventricular tachycardia or SVT. So SVT or AV nodal range in tachycardia is any dysrhythmia that above that originates above the uh, bundle of his and includes a variety of diagnoses. The treatment involves restoring the AV nodal conduction, um, interrupting the reentry circuit, and either through increasing parasympathetic tone or AV nodal blockade. Your uh, first line treatment are your vagal maneuvers, which you guys are way more familiar with that than I am. So. Not really going to go over it, but it's been shown that it restores sinus rhythm in about 43% of cases. But drug-wise, adenosine is your standard pharmacologic therapy, uh, and it's shown to be effective in, a, in over 80% of cases. So adenosine show, slows the conduction of time through the AV node, interrupting the re-entry pathways through the AV node and restores normal sinus rhythm. The initial dose is six milligrams followed by 12 and 12 repeated if previous doses are ineffective. The key thing to know is that um, if patients are, if patients already have a central line and you're gonna be administering it through that, you wanna lower the dose to three milligrams and then do uh, six and six. Or um, if uh, patients are on carbamazepine or dipyridamol, you want to also lower it to three and then six and six, just because they potentiate the toxic effects of adenosine. Um, but if patients are recently had, you know, a ton of caffeine, say they were studying for uh, an exam and they come in an SVT and they took, had a lot of coffee or took some caffeine pills, you might want to give them a higher dose because caffeine uh, is competitively uh, it is competitive against adenosine, so you want to give them a higher dose and start with um, 18, or start, sorry, start with 12 and then go to 18 and 18. Um, because it has a super short half-life of about a 10 seconds, the way you give it is really important. So there's a couple of different strategies that you can do. You can use a three-way stopcock, or you can use it all in one syringe. So you uh, get the vial and you draw it up into one syringe of like, um, 10 mLs of saline and you put it in and just slam it into the patient, or you can use a three-way stopcock where you push in the adenosine and then you flush the, with a the whole flush into the patient. But you have to do it really quickly because you wanna make sure the adenosine actually reaches the heart before it denatures in the patient's veins. Lastly, we're gonna go over ventricular tachycardia. So um, electrolyzed synchronized cardioversion is the most effective therapy for VTAC and should be performed if the patient is unstable or if medication therapy fails. Um, appropriate sedation and analgesia should be provided as obviously it's very uncomfortable, but if the patient is stable, you can use antirhythmic agents to chemically cardiovert. As with AFib, you can use similar agents. Um, you can use amiodarone. Like before, it's the same dosing as you do as you use for AFib, as it's a class three antiarrhythmic, so it blocks your uh, potassium channels. It also has some beta adrenergic um, calcium and sodium channel antagonism. So overall, it decreases the AV node conduction acutely. It prolongs the effective refractory period and um, of the atrium and ventricle over time. Um, the key adverse effects it does it does cause hypotension and it can cause some pulmonary toxicity. Um, but it does cause some resolution of uh, VTAC about 25 to 40% of the time. 
Procainamide is also a drug we can use in BTAC. Dose is the same as an AFib, uh, administered the same way. Like I said, it's a class one anti 1A antiarrhythmic, so it's a sodium channel blockade. Main adverse effects are hypotension, QRS prolongation, um, and it uh, has a VT resolution about 60 to 80% of the time. Um, and one of the studies that actually kind of has promoted the use of procainamide more in BTAC is, has been the Procamio trial. So it was a prospective multi-center randomized open label trial that looked at um, procainamide versus amiodarone in 62 patients, including 49 of them with structural heart disease. Um, and they looked at the primary outcome, which were cardiac adverse events, and they found that procainamide had less adverse events than amiodarone and had a higher rate of termination of VTAC within 40 minutes compared to amiodarone. So could be an option that we can start using here if you guys are interested. Um, we also have lidocaine that we can use. It is a class 1B antirrhythmic sodium channel blockade. Um, the dose is 1 to 1.5 mg per keg, around 100 milligram bolus can be repeated at 0.5 milligrams per kilo up to three milligrams per kilo total. Benefit is that it comes in a little carpet jet like your Epi's, comes in the code tray, so you can just give it all in one. It's really easy, easily accessible in the ER. Um, it's less effective than other options. Its resolution rate is 10 to 25%, but really if you've tried all other options, um, the patient's refusing to get cardioverted, you can try this as well. Other options that we have, Sotolol we don't have here, but you might be in other hospitals that do. Um, it is a class three antiarrhythmic, so sodium uh, potassium uh, channel blockade, but also has some uh, beta adrenergic agonist uh, effects. And in a prospective study comparing Sotolol to lidocaine, it showed that it had a higher rate of VTAC termination uh, compared to lidocaine within 15 minutes. Um, it's doses 1.5 mg per keg of 100, around 100 milligrams IV. Um, but mainly your best option in any of these arrhythmias is cardioversion. Um, that's your first line, especially if your patients are unstable, drug cardioversion. Um, over any medication, drug cardioversion. Um, lastly, torsades. So it's a type of polymorphic uh, ventricular tachycardia, typically uh, with variations in the QRS morphology or axis. It's usually intermittent and it spontane spontaneously terminates, but it can sometimes uh, come back and degenerate into VFib. Um, if the patient is unstable or becomes pulseless, uh, defibrillation is indicated, but synchronized uh, synchronization of the uh, defibrillator, defibrillator device can be somewhat complicated, so non-synchronized shocks are advised. But your mainstay of treatment is uh, magnesium sulfate. So it's two grams of URIO given over 10 to 15 minutes. Obviously, if the patient is unstable or they are in pulses VFib or VTAG, you can just give the two grams, uh, just slam it in. They're already essentially pulses. Um, so they won't, the blood pressure management portion, portion of it is not important, but their main, its main adverse effect is hypotension. Um, amio and procainamide are not recommended as initial therapies as they both prolong the QT interval, but lidocaine is an option if there's, um, but there's no prospective data to show its use. So as lastly, as main takeaways, there are a ton of antiarrhythmics and there's, I think, still more that are being studied and coming out. So I know it can be overwhelming, but in the ER, there's only a handful that we actually use. So it's so good to keep in mind, like have a good grasp of the ones that we actually use. We have your calcium channel blockers, which are diltiazem and brapamil, mainly just diltiazem. Your beta blockers, mainly metoprolol, sometimes esmolol. Imiodarone, which is your main one, potentially procainamide if we decide that that could be an option that we use since the evidence shows that it could be more beneficial. Digoxin is a great option in your heart failure patients. Adenosine is your mainstay for um, SVT and magnesium for torsades. If a patient is unstable, cardioversion is your management of choice. AFib, rate control is your preferred uh, rate of your preferred management versus rhythm control. 
Um, and diltiazem may achieve faster rate control than metropolol, but metropolol is preferred in patients who also have half breath. And in VTAC, procainamide may be more effective at terminating ventricular rhythms than amiodarone. Does anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm.